Seafood Watch here. It's National Lobster Day. Give fungi a try. We love this vegan faux lobster roll by Hot for Food made with mushrooms. It's guaranteed to be the best summer sandwich you'll have this year. Lobsters are now red listed by a sustainability group that works with national brands such as Whole Foods. No one wants their appetite for seafood to be driving a species to extinction. No one wants to know that their appetite for seafood is driving a species to extinction. When you get up in the morning, you know you've got everybody on earth after you. The federal government, the state, the wind, the whales, everything. They all want to drive this industry down. I guess we've done too good of a job. The media frenzy stoked by a comprehensive public relations assault on Maine lobstermen on the first full week of September 2022 was jarring for the people who live and work on the coast of Maine. It revolved around a press release and report produced and broadcasted from coast to coast by a self-proclaimed watchdog group, as they call themselves, Seafood Watch, which is operated by a certain California aquarium. This aquarium has publicly stated repeatedly that their number one goal, their primary vision they seek to accomplish, is to promote a net zero future, which requires the elimination of small boat fixed gear fisheries in favor of futuristic subsidized revenue streams for multinational corporations like offshore wind farms and industrial aquaculture. So these net zero activists spent the entire week in an organized effort to gin up wall-to-wall -wall coverage of their document seeking negative press for Maine lobstermen. And one after the other, legacy media outlets took the bait and gave legs to their clickbait press release. Is lobster being blacklisted? Not exactly. You'll still be able to find the delicacy on menus and in markets, but a watchdog group says you might want to avoid it. In turn, some prominent food corporations who are invested in the net zero narrative dutifully swore to stop buying and selling Maine lobster which will have the effect of further straining the pocketbooks of the men and women working on the water who have already been dealing with a price that's been crushed to 50% less than last summer's record highs. And of course, all wild bait and fuel keep soaring to new record highs. So you're probably wondering what bombshell, what breaking news is in this new report that was able to bring about so much pandemonium? and have legacy media outlets racing to push the story across the country into every state whose news media picks up stories from the AP or USA Today. Clickbait headline aside, what's the revelation that makes Monterey Bay's latest anti-fishing assault so newsworthy? And why would national companies refuse to sell their customers a highly coveted, highly sustainable, and readily available wild-caught seafood? The claim is that Maine lobster gear poses a threat to entangle and kill right whales. That's the ongoing controversy we've been covering here in the past, where deep-pocketed nonprofits are petitioning the federal government to force Maine lobstermen to take all of their end lines out of the water permanently. Because they say these end lines could in theory kill a breed of whale that rarely, if ever, enters their fishing grounds, even though that scenario has never come to pass, not even once in a lifetime. These same nonprofits leading the charge either look the other way for or actively support and are invested in fast tracking the construction of industrial wind farms in these very same areas. And we've documented the myriad ways that floating wind farms would definitely damage all animal and plant life in the ocean where they would be installed ironically including the very species of whale that Maine lobstermen have never killed or seriously injured, but are on the verge of losing their livelihoods over. I could go on, but you know all this if you've been following this series. So what's new? Did a whale get entangled in Maine lobster gear? Did something happen to prove a threat to right whales from Maine lobstermen? If you download the full Monterey Bay Aquarium report, which spans 130 pages, you'll find exactly nothing new. No new developments, no new data, nothing at all to justify the continued campaign against this fishery. Just the same old rehashed speculations and theoretical calculations 
Right now, science indicates most entanglements are not recorded. 90% can't be linked to a particular gear type. So that's the evidence we're looking for. They have made a decision which, will, which is a knife in the back of the lobster industry in Maine with no evidence. I wish, I wish on the whale front that people could actually see they're not where we fish. Right whales are not prevalent in Maine. And they're not prevalent in the waters offshore of Maine, or at least not within the federal boundaries. I know they're not around. The people that fish around me know they're not around. But, you know, the average Joe who's just reading what he reads on the internet or in a newspaper, you know, they could tell him that right whales are dropping out of the sky, they're so thick in our area, and they don't know the difference. But just when all this media hype was reaching a fever pitch last week, there was a new development in a related story, and this one is much more substantial. The high-profile MLA lawsuit against National Marine Fisheries Service regarding their most recent set of whale regulations. And we've been talking about this all the way back to episode one. It's the so-called 98% risk reduction that in three phases would eliminate most lobstermen's businesses by 2030. And wouldn't you know, within only 48 hours of global offshore wind proponent Oceana jumping into the fray to carry their share of the Monterey Bay Blitz, while most of the media attention was focused on this red list hype, a judge struck down the lobsterman's bid to end the arbitrary persecution, granting National Marine Fisheries Service permission to resume putting them out of business and the unelected officials at that agency are wasting no time pouncing back onto the fishermen with a vengeance. Lobsterman Dustin Delano from Friendship, Maine shared what the whale take reduction team is cooking up, and it's not good. These federal employees have decided that the 98% reduction on Maine's lobster fishery by 2030 is not aggressive enough for their taste. They want to hit Maine lobstermen with a full 90% reduction Keep in mind, in their system, a 94% reduction would be the permanent removal of all federally permitted lobstermen's fixed gear from the offshore waters that are exactly where the wind farms are slated to go up. And after lobstermen just complied last year with a sizable 60% risk reduction that they were hit with, NMFS wants to chop them down by another 90% from today's fishery standards in just one year. They're playing with people's lives as they spitball huge, arbitrary seasonal closures of the federal fishery for months at a time. And I apologize that as the words come out of my mouth, this sounds like hyperbole, it sounds like I've gotta be exaggerating, but this is catastrophic and it will kick off a wave of bankruptcies for fishing families as soon as next year if we stand for it. And what exactly would it accomplish? Quick digression, here's a great example of a leader from the whale take reduction team. This is Amy Knowlton of the New England Aquarium. And this is a clip of her stating something that is provably false at one of the screenings this year for the Last of the Right Whales documentary, only to be fact-checked in real time by lobsterman Matt Gilly. We've had the same rope since the 1970s. I think what we're trying to do is address the whole rope because the whole rope is too strong. And that in my research, I've learned that rope strengths, because of a manufacturing change in the mid 1990s, nearly doubled in strength. Not Maybe not every lobsterman has shifted to those copolymer co ropes, but in our research, we learned that the, the rope strengths have definitely gotten stronger. Um, because of this manufacturing improvement for the, you know, to, to have rope that lasts longer for the fishermen. It's illegal for us to use polymer rope in the United States. I think it's illegal to use leaded rope. But no, we cannot use floating plastic rope. Okay. Well, it, I think from where I've, the research I've done and looking at all the ropes that have been removed from entangled whales, there's a lot of the, the copolymer, poly, what's called polysteel yeah. rope. Um, seen in, in all fishing gear, all the ropes were removed, much of it had the poly steel. So. That, my friends, is an example of one of the leaders who gets to write the rules for fishermen and set the narrative for the general public. Is it becoming more obvious why letting these people run the show is a problem? 
the hypocrisy of how their science works stinks. It's just disgusting. And a lot of times it does feel like they have an end result they want to achieve and they shape their math to get there. Like with their take reduction plan, their biological assessment, uh, the draft opinion I believe it's called. It seems like they have a number in mind to start with that they want so that they can dump regulations and they cherry pick from here and there, ignore this, focus on this to get to that. It feels like we're extremely outgunned money-wise. I have no doubt that the fishermen know as much, if not more, about the area we fish because we are there every day working it than all the whale scientists that NOAA has to offer. But they're the scientists, they got the education, they're looked upon as the experts, and you take that and the amount of money that's backing all of this, money talks. They should be the ones sitting behind bars. They should be prosecuted for creating trouble. We don't have trouble. Fishermen are like a strong bunch of people, but they're not like heartless. And I do think that there's some stuff that's being said that's just not true in my opinion. I just... You know, I wish people would see the truth for themselves. I've never seen a whale entanglement. I've never heard of a whale entanglement. You know, not local here, not in Maine. We all care about the ocean. We all care about the creatures inside of it. I mean, we rely on it and respect it. When it comes down to it, we were stewards of the whole ecosystem before anybody else was. 20 some odd years ago, we implemented the 600 pound breakaways on our pop boys. Now we have to go with a 1,700 pound breakaway halfway down a rope or two every third. I mean, if you want entanglements, would you rather have a pop boy floating or 30 fathom rope? There is no benefit to the 1,700 pound breakaway. That's plain and simple. Everything we've done this year, they're telling us to put 1,700 pound breakaways on, on the main rope and taking off what actually snarls up if they was whales up here, the 600 pound breakaways. Now you do the math. The 600 pound breakaways are gonna give up easier and the end flags and balloons that we use, 600 pounds, you cannot tow an end flag behind your boat over 10 miles an hour. It will snap them off. And to put 1,700 pounds on it, it it's, it's, there's no math there. If you have a 1,700 pound breakaway halfway down your rope, Say you get snagged on something, running out, gets caught on something, pops off, you don't know it. You're making more crap in the ocean, hard telling what can get tangled up in it. Seals, whales, turtles, and then you got a lot more ghost gear, which gets blamed on us. We, we don't want to lose our gear. A new trap like this goes for $120 sometimes, sometimes more. Depends on what you want for a trap. I don't want to lose them traps. Most time it's two, three, some people fish fives, 10, 20, 25 trap trawls. I mean, you're talking thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. In the bay, we have to have weak links right up to shore. There is no exemption. 10 feet of water, you're putting a weak link in halfway down. Takes a lot of time and it's cost me a lot of money. I, for the last several years, have used the spreader, the rope that goes from one trap to another on a trawl, when I put traps in the bay for the summer, as my bay ropes. Just tie a buoy to the end of it, there you go. That's no longer possible because I can't have a plastic link between every trap on a trawl offshore. That's a disaster waiting to happen. I can't complain so far about how the end lines go through the hauler with the weak links, that seems to be working all right, but it has definitely increased the difficulty of getting gear ready and increased the expense. I would say, not counting the price of the weak links themselves, I'm gonna guess it cost me an extra 1,500 to 2,000 in rope this season. 
and that will be a recurring expense, as rope wears out. I've never laid eyes on a right whale and don't know of anyone that fishes around me that has. The vocal opponents of fishing like to counter Maine Lobsterman's defense of their unblemished track record for nearly 20 years by saying things like, just because we haven't identified Maine gear on a right whale, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened and we just never found the evidence. As far as you, if you don't see them, that doesn't mean they're not there. We're talking animal they claim they can't tag and they go by visual identification when they're doing their counts. So, you know, if they're there, whether you see them or not, applies to me. Why doesn't it apply to the people doing the counting? It's a large ocean, very deep. New species are discovered on a regular basis. We know less about the ocean than we do about space. And they're going to sit there and try to tell you that this is exactly the number of right whales, or within a certain percentage, this is the number of right whales. The math they use, I went to the forum in Rockport, I believe it was, at the Samoset several years back now, and some of the whale scientists were there explaining how they do their math to us poor, uneducated fishermen. Their math is largely guesswork and conjecture. At one point they said if they see one dead right whale, they can assume that there are two dead. If I see you dead, I'm not gonna assume your next door neighbor kicked it too. We don't affect the whales in where we are. Uh, we don't have the, I've never seen a right whale in my life. And I've been on the water now for over 40 years. So it, 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 that's, that's crazy. That's just like uh, taking everybody's vehicles away because someone got in a car crash. You know, it's, it's crazy. You, you can't penalize us for something that we haven't even done yet. I realize we're the easiest ones to pick on because we have the least amount of money to work with. You're not gonna pick on the oil companies and, the, and all these tankers and freighters, so they'll just pick on the low guy and, and we're the ones that take the brunt of it all. And you can't fight it when it comes to the battle in court. They've got way more money than, than we do. And then you've got a lot of these uh, animal rights activists that don't even understand what they're campaigning for. And they don't care how many people that they're destroying in the process. And, and it's really, it makes it difficult for the fishermen. As I'm sterning, I try and keep like a good attitude and I think I think that's important when you're working on small boats, is having like a good attitude and, and optimism and hope. Um, the biggest thing that weighs on me is that the guys that, you know, that we're going with, they're like, it's weighing on them maybe more than me, where they have to, they have to face it, and I'm just kind of along for the ride, but it's a drag to feel that the future is uncertain. Money talks, and um, I don't think lobstermen have that money to like push people and organizations around for any agenda. You know, they just go in a hall, bring in their catch, feeding people, and that's their thing. And but things are happening outside of our control, and that that should be scary for everyone. With all of this as the context. Here's a lightning round review of the last couple decades of whale safety data in relation to Maine lobstermen. Because these aggressive attacks, primarily on the regulatory front, but legitimized and supported secondarily in the media landscape, are coming faster and faster over the last several years. And back in 2004, one right whale was documented to be entangled in Maine lobster gear. They had one supposedly down in southern Maine. They say it was entangled. No proof of it. No pictures, no actual proof. That whale was not seriously injured, and it did not die during or after the entanglement that it was freed from. But that incident sparked the industry to voluntarily ramp up efforts that they had begun in 1997 to innovate their gear to make it more whale safe. And over the ensuing years, they continued that process to make their gear as whale safe as humanly possible. So what were the results of their hard work in this area? Let's look at the hard data. 2005, right whale entanglements, zero. Entanglements in 2006, zero. 
entanglements in 2007, zero in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, zero. In 2017, this year began a pattern of an unusually large amount of whales descending on the Gulf of St. Lawrence up in Canada. But in Maine, zero entanglements. 2018, zero. 2019, zero. 2020, it's important to note a documentary was released by a Boston Globe reporter that conflated an unfortunate rash of right whale entanglements in snow crab gear up in Canada with aggressive new restrictions being pushed onto U.S. fisheries by our whale take reduction team. In the midst of all this, COVID lockdowns temporarily impeded the cruise industry and shipping industry, which demonstrably lowered the whale deaths that usually occurred from large ship strikes. Maine lobstermen were one industry that didn't have to stop going to work because of lockdowns and continued full speed ahead with a normal year's effort at fishing. Whale entanglements in Maine lobster gear, year 2020, zero. 2021, Maine lobstermen complied with a whole new onslaught of restrictions involving additional weak links, new rope changes, more traps on a trawl, etc. And like the previous decade and a half before these restrictions came along, there were again zero right whale entanglements. Which brings us to this year, 2022, the first full calendar year that Maine lobstermen have been subject to last year's 60% risk reduction. And again, zero right whale entanglements for 18 years straight now. And September kicks us off with a bang, a media firestorm over the net zero foot soldiers at the California Aquarium, along with partnering offshore wind lobbyists like Oceana, assisting in telling the public to avoid Maine lobster on the excuse that our lobstermen pose such a risk to right whales. A judge refuses to acknowledge that Maine lobstermen are completely whale safe with a perfect track record for going on 20 years, and the feds move to strike a potentially fatal blow next year to our lobster fishery with a catastrophic 90% risk reduction. Despite the fact that Maine's lobstermen have already achieved a 100% success rate at preventing whale entanglements for 18 consecutive years and running. How can we possibly make sense of this sequence of events? Jonesport lobsterman Tim Peabody provided me what might be the most compact summary that I could hope for. Well, I hate to put it this way, but it's a bunch of bullshit. I think if there's one thing that everybody here today can agree on is that right whales deserve to be protected. They're majestic animals. But I'd go a step further and argue that Maine lobstermen have probably put in more effort, more time, and more money than any group in this country to protect right whales. Our industry has done everything from replacing our floating rope with sinking rope, putting weak links into our end lines, and then putting new and different weak links into our end lines. We have reduced the number of end lines in the water, and in the process, as Senator King just said, removed over 30,000 miles of rope from the Gulf of Maine. We mark all our gear so that in the unlikely event of an entanglement, we know exactly where that entanglement occurred. And most recently, we closed 967 square miles of the Gulf of Maine to fishing during very, very productive times of year. That's a lot of effort. So given this, you would think this assessment by Seafood Watch would take all of that into account because the commissioner, the governor, the senator, Luke, Steve, myself, and many others have had four years of conversations with this Seafood Watch group. You would think they would take all of that information and give us a score of five out of five on criterion three, which is management effectiveness. You want to guess what we got? We got a one out of five, the lowest score possible. All of that information fell on deaf ears at Seafood Watch. All of that information has fallen on deaf ears at the National Marine Fisheries Service. All of that information fell on deaf ears with Judge Boesberg and his awful decision yesterday. Make no mistake about it, our future as an industry is at stake. The future of my wife, who is here today, and our two children is at stake. 
the future of coastal communities from Kittery to Cutler is at stake and the future of our country's most iconic and sustainable fishery is at stake. Just tell me what to do. I pick on Area 1, the Gulf of Maine. It's a small strip, it's a big gulf, and we only have a small strip of water to fish in, and they want to drive us out for wind and whales. We'll work with anybody, but work with us. We're not going to go away. Um, we will fight this, um, and we're ready for that fight.